Hi, this is Fernando Gomez Sancha again, and this time I'm going to show a uh, holip I performed recently in a patient who came with an ultrasound estimation of a very large gland, uh, around 250 grams uh, on, on the ultrasound estimation, which as uh, usual showed to be a little bit smaller. So this is the endoscopic uh, look. You can see how the veru has a very long, um, a very long uh, tail uh, because the adenoma, when it grows, pushes uh, downwards, and then the veru is not anymore a good uh, indication of where the sphincter is. So sometimes it's uh, two, three, four, even. Well, I guess it's more two centimeters uh, or so away from the sphincter, you see the big um, apical lobes. That's me putting the fiber inside. And that's the edge of the sphincter. So as always, I start tr trying to mark the, the white line. So basically here, I'm marking the limit between the sphincter and the apex of the anoma. Always, you know, checking and I don't think you have to be particularly, you know, extra careful to do the white line more inside, you know, because basically the plane is where it is. And if you try to go one centimeter more inside to do this uh, mucosal incision, trying to play it safe, the thing is that when you develop the plane, mucosa might rupture uh, not through your incision, but mm, following that anatomical plane. So I think you have to get very close to the to the sphincter to mark this mucosal um, line. And uh, often in the bigger glands like this, you can find that uh, there is uh, mucosal bleeding at the beginning. So my advice is try to complete the mark of the white line as, as much as you can to have a reference because you want to have an easy reference to recognize the apical limit of, of the operation. And then just uh, go inside, you see, that's a white line. Once you have done the white line, there is a reliable um, mark of where is this uh, limit. Uh, so that looks like a relatively good plane. Let's go to the other side now and repeat the maneuver because we want to uh, develop the posterior plane before we move on to trying to release the apex. I think this is called early apical release because the release of the apex is performed early in the operation, but it cannot be immediate. You know, you need some access if you want to reach uh, around the sphincter, uh, around the apex circumfer circumferentially. Uh, without causing stretching and and uh, probably damage to the sphincter. So that's why I think it is important to mobilize a little bit the apex so it can move freely and that will reduce the tension on, on the sphincter. And here, after entering the plane in both sides, this is the connection in the midline, cutting the frenulum of the veru and trying to uh, stay in, in a plane that is not, uh, you know, going too deep. Because if you cut deep over the veru, very often you're going to see that you're cutting the ejaculatory duct, which I think is probably not so relevant, not so important. But uh, probably it is better huh? if you don't, if you don't cut it. Occasionally, very, very seldom, we have seen patients uh, commenting on painful ejaculation after after holep. So maybe maybe it has something to do with cutting the the ejaculatory ducts. I think we see very few patients with this complaint, and we see more of the you know during the dissection. Sometimes we cut. Uh, this duct or the 
um, maybe at the apex or maybe even you know closer to the bladder neck and I would say that we cut them much more often than we get complaints you no know? but uh, in in some patients it might might be it might be a cause for this for this uh, complaint okay so here uh, this is the access lines you know it's it's difficult to explain but if you want to access the the lateral plane which is what i'm doing now this is what i call the mobilize and connect uh, phase here i'm mobilizing the lateral aspect uh, posterior lateral aspect of the adenoma and I make sure that I connect the line of dissection with the posterior line so we always have a nice reference of uh, where we are trying to keep only one line so you don't want to do several lines just keep keep on your line you know and correct if you go too deep you have to aim your laser a little bit closer to the adenoma if you if you um, see that you're leaving tissue behind, then you have to go out and uh, try to correct, but try to keep a single line that you can always recognize, you can always come back to as, as a reference. And this is a careful ascension towards the 12 o'clock region. You see here, initially you have to make a cut on the tissue, even if you cut on the adenoma, it doesn't matter. This cut is going to open some access you know, you will get gain access. You will gain access and slowly you can continue the mobilization. You see that I don't stay uh, too close to the sphincter. I want to go maybe one, two, three, I don't know, centimeters uh, in the direction of the bladder neck because that is what gives mobility to the apex, you know. If the apex is attached to the capsule, it's very difficult to find the elasticity enough in the tissue to be able to access the 12 o'clock region without causing you know stress and trauma so this mobilization he, here you see that as we ascend it becomes easier and easier to to see what's going on to reach the 12 o'clock area so of course always you have to have in mind that uh, you have three three factors that you have to all the time you know think about during the operation and that is the working distance working distance will give you uh, a more aggressive or less aggressive effect of dissection or cutting then you you um, have to take into account how fast you know you're moving your fiber if you move slowly you will give the energy time to to coagulate if you move faster, of course, you, you you will progress faster. But I think speed in enucleation is not achieved by rushing, you know, the operation. I think it is achieved by developing the skill, you know, your skills, so you can work most of the time. You can see that we pause a little bit, the laser action, for some moments, but we keep the the pausing time very 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 uh, to the minimum huh? so you don't want to to stop too much here I probably was doing some explanation how uh, distance is important to to do the tissue effect and also if you don't move the laser there's no effect so these two things have to be uh, computed okay here I think I had some trouble with the leg you know sometimes you want to reach uh, laterally and you have some trouble with the leg, so I probably had to move it a little bit to to be able to gain access, uh, and uh, probably that plane was not good enough. Okay, so here you can see how the third factor comes into play. Here, there's the distance, there's the movement, but also you need to be good at aiming. You know, so normally in the first part of the operation, you're going to aim, generally speaking, towards the line of dissection. But in cases like this, where you find that you were losing the plane, you were, you know, cutting into the adenoma, you, you have to actually correct, correct this plane. Here, this is about mobilizing, entering the lateral plane, and 
mobilizing the epic so this is mobilization and connection you see i always try to connect my lines so i'm not i'm not getting lost you know and there there is some apical tissue it's somewhat difficult to reach because of the you know leg interference as i said we have one of these uh, movable you know leg supports that you can handle yourself uh, through the through the drape and they're very very useful for this for these cases so you see but instead of forcing too much or you know making a lot of tension in the tissue you 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 know patiently try to gain a little bit uh, more and more and uh, again i think i was explaining during the case how it is important to think about how the distance you see firing outside of the line firing against the line or firing uh but what i was saying is if you think that that's the false plane this is a good plane so we correct huh? there's no problem and then uh, we try to progress towards the anterior part carefully that is obviously anomatous tissue so we have to keep going uh, you know peripherally externally to try to get a better idea to, to try to understand where the plane wants to go and so that we don't leave uh, abnormatus nodules huh? sometimes we see them at the apex and they are a cause for you know obstruction over time and i have had to reoperate uh, some patients not very common but it can happen huh? a patient where you remove a lot of tissue who develops obstructive voiding because there is some tissue left behind So that's again, you see, coming up, ascending, you know, uh, going around the apical tissue, but after proper mobilization. You don't want to go in there, you know, trying to get up and make a lot of force and make a lot of uh, tension. And what you want is to progress carefully. You see, when you go up uh, near the sphincter, you have to be careful. Typically, I, I hold a camera and I hold the, the, the scope and the fiber with my fingertips. I don't want to be stressing, you know, doing force. Very, very rarely I do. And if I do some force, it's more like a, I don't know how to say, sometimes you have to do a little bit of progressive, careful, um, very careful force. You know, force is not, is not a good idea in endoscopic procedures. And I think, this this uh, you know careful approach to the apex pays off pays off. Hmm. There was a tweet uh, recently where mm, someone said I I do in block and I have stress incontinence. Well, you know if that happens, the thing you need to try to you know evaluate how careful you are while dissecting the apex and pay attention to detail because we really get a very low. Uh, incidence of stress incontinence. Sometimes, sometimes it happens, you know. But, but of course, it's not uh, twenty, thirty percent of the cases. You know, it's more like two or three percent, one or two percent. It's really a problem that uh, when it happens, it's usually mild incontinence, and of course, uh, you know, we are not uh, able uh, to prevent it always, but. Most of the time, you know, when you try to do this approach, and here you see the advantage of coming from both sides is that now you can see, you see the prostate has descended a little bit, and you can know where to start cutting the 12 o'clock tissue and where to finish your cut. So this idea of releasing the apex early, I think, is a good idea to protect uh, continents. You see, we don't pay any effort to leave tissue in the apex, I think it's not necessary uh, or you know, we, we don't concentrate on that. We don't do any particular measure to preserve apical tissue anteriorly uh, and we, we get good continence because I think it's more this careful approach, you know, mobilizing the apex so it can move towards the side it gives you access 
to to the to the 12 o'clock area once the uh, sphincter is totally released from the apex uh, i think the stress to the sphincter is much less than when there are attachments and you're moving your scope around and here you can see how with this technique you can work almost continuously you see there's no need to stop you should train yourself to be able to dissect when you go up or when you go right and keep dissecting when you return you know to the to the some people stop go back to the starting point and then uh, um, lace again of course sometimes you have to look and see what's going on but you see the pausing time if we measured it it would be very very little and that is what gives you the speed okay there's no rushing i don't know what happened here maybe you know someone asked a question or there was some so i did a, a brief stop during the operation but uh what i'm saying is you should work with a tempo that allows you to dissect the plane of course you want to find a nice balance and be fast but not too fast, because if you are too fast, often the quality of hemostasis is going to be compromised. Also, you can see that I'm doing very wide movements. You see, when I start going up, I keep going up, and I follow the lines of the dissection, trying to keep in mind what is the working distance, what is the speed of movement, and where do I aim with my laser to get the effect I want. Of course, uh, at the beginning of the operation, probably the first half of the operation, the fiber uh, remains mostly parallel to the capsule. So if you fire against the line of dissection, there's very little risk of perforation. But as we approach the bladder neck, there is a change in the direction of the plane and it will become perpendicular to the fiber. So in that uh, situation, in the second half of the operation, you will have to target your laser closer to the adenoma. Because when you target the laser close to the adenoma, very little energy reaches the capsule, maybe some coagulative energy. And, and then, of course, uh, you... Uh, protect huh, and prevent the uh, possibility of a capsular perforation. Um, you, you need to be very conscious of the different effects that you can get with uh, the settings you choose to use. And then you have to make the most of them, you know, trying to apply the effects in a way that makes you progress safely and uh, remember to do wide movements. If you do wide movements like this, going from side to side, you will advance the line. It will be a uniform line. So you see, if you are uh, aiming towards a uniform line, it's much easier. It's much easier to keep uh, the right uh, distance. You know, the right working distance. If you do a very irregular line, you know, sometimes you will get too close. Sometimes you will get too, I mean, fire from too far, maybe not be effective. And also, you know, uh, keeping the lines healthy and nice and structured is hard work. Eh? You have to decide, you know, how, where do you go next? What do you do next? But trying to keep a coherent line that will uh, orient you and will help you. Because often, very often, you know, just by looking at the anato anatomical characteristics of the plane, you cannot tell if you are in the right plane or not. But if the line, you know, in some areas, you can see the fibrousness of the capsule, you can see how, you know, capsular this plane looks. So that means that if you follow these lines and it is coherent, you know, where you are, 
we, we all have uh, in our minds, you know, we all have how these lines go normally in, in, in the prostates. And I always recommend to think about an MRI of the prostate in a transverse section. You know, you can see, you can somehow uh, have the intuition that where the line is, is going to go and how, or how is it going to go. And then, of course, you have all these anatomical details and then you have the coherence of, of the line. Um, often, you know, the capsule is quite white and the enoma is more yellow. So we, we have to be careful. Here you can see how I'm starting to target the, the enoma and you will see it it's very, very subtle, but if you target your fiber a little bit closer to the adenoma, you will see that uh, even when the plane changes direction, you can safely um, uh, progress with your dissection without uh, perforating. So it's a mastery of working distance and understanding and anticipating the tissue effects. And here, I think we're getting close to see these vertical fibers that, you know, tell us that we are close to the entry into the bladder. And that's again a very nice moment in the operation because you have uh, entered, you have entered the, the bladder and now you have a nice additional reference to, to know your anatomy. I think this is especially useful when you want to when you want to to do the posterior plane uh, near the bladder neck. So I always try to you see to develop the lateral plane enough so that you can see the bladder neck uh, there. And that will help a lot. If you have this on both sides, then tackling the posterior remaining uh, region is, is quite easy. And here, of course, we have to try to see where the UO is. There it is. Huh? So there's quite a lot of distance. And uh, there we are trying to do the same thing on the other side, huh? going from the posterior aspect towards the anterior, trying to following the lines. But you can see now how the laser fiber is preferentially very, very close to the adenoma. You can see how by keeping the fiber there, you can continue with the dissection and not uh, deepen, you know, the into the into the capsule so you see you keep your fiber very very close very very close and if the capsule gets energy it's, it's more uh, coagulating energy than disruptive energy okay that's fundamental you have to master these subtleties of how to manipulate the fiber and how to make the most of the settings you you choose to use many people ask me what settings you use, you know, and I think the settings is just how the energy is coming out from the fiber. And more, much more important than that is how you manipulate the fiber to get the tissue effect you want. I always say that small perforations are allowed, meaning that sometimes, you know, when we do holep, you will get very often, you know, in some area, in some point, you might get uh, some deepening of, of the plane, some deepening into the into the peripheral zone. Um, even, you know, you might see some little fat, but you want to keep them small. OK, so <clears throat> recognizing that you are entering the peripheral zone and being able to retarget your fiber closer to the adenoma to prevent uh, going in, I think it's it's uh, paramount. So again, you see, you have to work hard to make your lines uniform, to correct the irregularities. Here, the fiber, you see, it's 
mostly close to the Anoma, trying to cut the attachments between the Anoma and capsule, but trying to keep the effect of the energy on the capsule very, 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 very um, limited, no, very not aggressive. And also <laughs> regarding the attitude of the surgeon, you know, you have to be very relaxed. This is a very technical operation where emotion or anxiety or fear, you know, has no, no place. Huh? So you are a technician and uh, you will be very, very analytic and very, very observant of what's going on. And you take the right decisions during the operation to make it progress. Don't get anxious, don't get, you know, stressed because it can be a very relaxed operation, a lot of fun, you know, to perform and um, just, you know, be technical. Huh? And if, if something happens that makes the procedure uh, unsafe for the patient, uh, you can stop, put a catheter and you come back another day, you know, and this probably might happen at the beginning of your experience, but then it will happen, you know, less and less often. It is very, very rare that I had to stop uh, an operation because something bad happened, but I am absolutely convinced that I will do if, if I need to. Huh? So I'm generally very relaxed and very happy performing uh, HOLEP, using the energy. And you see, if you can carry a nice hemostasis like this, it's a joy. It's a joy to perform. And interestingly, you know, sometimes the, this final part of the block approach is a little bit tricky in the sense that you have to achieve gains in, in mobility, you know, progressively and strategically to be able to enter the posterior plane and reach the bladder neck. So here, for example, if you don't liberate, if you don't release these this, this attachments of the adenoma to the bladder neck, you know, the mobility of the adenoma is, is, is quite low, it's quite bad. So, you know, the approach to the, to the posterior aspect is, is very progressive and you have to release the attachments around it uh, in both sides uh, in order to be able to get there without using a lot of force and without doing traction and without endangering. You know, traction also is a bad idea uh, when you do HOLEP because in some patients, especially in the patients with prostates like this, with very large prostates, you will um, risk damaging the capsule if you do force. You know, it's a very thin capsule sometimes. I don't know, it might be two or three millimeters, you know, thick in, in some cases. So if you push too much, if you do force, if you try to do, you know, hard mechanical dissection, things like this, you can, you can, you can perforate. So I like to be able to dissect with the laser, you know, not needing to do mechanical dissection. Uh, here again, you see, we check the position of the UO. And... Every every minute of the operation, things get better. Every time you release a little bit of that uh, attachment uh, of the adenoma to the capsule, the access gets improving. So if you find that there is an area where you can hardly access, go somewhere else and release somewhere else because the mobility of the adenoma will be constantly improving and you will uh, find your way. I understand this could be a little bit difficult for beginners, you know, but my advice is to go where it's where it's easy to work and then, you know, the difficult areas will become easier. So I guess for those of you who have watched more of my videos, uh, this is just repeating the same mantras and the same ideas, but I think they make sense uh, here. You can see I'm trying to see if I can push the adenoma into the bladder and, and that happened. I could push a little bit of that side and now the other side is more open and I gain. So this is a nice trick uh, for the end of the operation. If you see that the attachment of the adenoma at 6 o'clock is not so bad, it's not so big, 
um, you can try to push gently the one of the sides of the unknown mind to the bladder and then the other side will get much better uh, access and space. Never push too hard because if you push very hard you can break the capsule and you see all these attachments if you're pushing uh, the contralateral side these attachments will pull from the capsule and might open uh, a perforation. So here again, you see, always until the end, try to do lines that will allow you to recognize uh, where you are. Keep hemostasis if you can. Uh, all the time you spend doing hemostasis while the adenoma is in the fossa is a good idea because if the adenoma is in the fossa, the irrigation irrigates very well. And when you push it in the bladder, then all the bleeders that you have in the capsule are going to throw blood and the irrigation is less uh, efficient, you know, at that time. So here I wanted to push slightly more on that side. And again, you know, we gained a little bit more of mobility. And yeah, you keep on going, you know. Don't Don't rush it, don't... Lose your temper, you know, your patience. Just keep going, you know, accept that the operation will need uh, the time it will need. Here, often I change the 5 or 6 o'clock uh, towards the end of the procedure. Where is the UO? It's around there somewhere. Just a little bit elusive. Ah, there it is. And the other side also quite separated from where we are, but it's nice to, to be able to see where it is. And sometimes it's funny, yeah, there it is, it's a little bit hidden. So now the adenoma has flipped completely into the bladder and uh, just we have to cut the attachments at six o'clock, you see. So the prostate uh, was not as large as uh, advertised, you know. Um, I will show you at the end of the video the pathologic report. I think it was 153 grams of adenoma. But you can see that it took 30 minutes, uh, 32 minutes to enucleate it. And I never rushed it too much. It was not a crazy, um, you know, enucleation. It was just a very, very efficient step-by-step -step liberation and uh good uh hemostasis as we go um of course you always have to check the mucosa at the end you have to get in and look and make sure because i think this is where most of the visibility problems with morselation um can happen you know if you if you don't go inside and, and have a look at the mucosa, often you might miss some bleeders that are not so easy to see from the inside of the fossa. And um, it is very nice to morselate when you have good visibility and good hemostasis. And it's very stressful to morselate with bad visibility and bad hemostasis. So my advice is to gain yeah, good hemostasis before rushing into morselation. With experience, you are very safe morselating, even in a low visibility, but that comes with, with time and understanding. And I have to say the feeling of morselating with low visibility is not, uh, not nice. It's much better to, to have this good mucosal control. Here I am using uh, one joule, I think 35 hertz, and I, cho I chose to use a long pulse. You know, the long pulse is very hemostatic and uh, the low energy uh, makes it uh, not too aggressive, you know, against the tissues. So the main effect is, is more hemostatic than disruptive, you know. There we are. So nice fossa, nice case, nice progression. And, and I think this is how Enucleation should look, you know, you should, you should, um, 
I don't know, tend to improve your skills so that you are able to um, progress steadily, you know, no need to rush. And of course, make a very, very, very precise use of the energy to achieve the effect you want. Um, reading the anatomy correctly is, is important. And this is something that doesn't come easy at the beginning. You know, if you see two or three cases, you, you will feel lost, you know, if you try to do it yourself with such a short uh, experience. So my, my advice is to see a lot of operations, to see a lot of videos, you know, to do, spend the time. There's an American colleague who told me I lost uh, 10 pounds watching your videos. And uh, I said, how come? And he said, well, you know, I, I use the static bike while I watch your videos, you know, and so I, I lost a lot of weight. So this is the spirit. I think watch videos, you know, try to try to learn uh, from everybody. And um, of course, um, there's a lot of people now publishing their videos, which is uh, great. But you have to try to um, be aware that there is uh, it's very easy to publish a video, but it's very difficult to to have the, the, the knowledge and the concepts and to have the sound advice. So you should listen to what people say critically, even to what I say, because as you know, expert opinion is, is the lowest form of quality of evidence. But you can see that the sphincter has been very, very nicely preserved. The mucosa is covering the sphincter and we have managed to, to perform a very, very careful enucleation with very, very careful uh, manipulation of the scope without traction, without uh, aggressiveness, you know, very delicate uh, dissection. And uh, despite the apparent kuthemstasis, I'm a little bit thorough uh, to try to, especially in the large glands, you know, in the large glands you need to be as thorough as you can be to to ensure that you have a good hemostasis patients really appreciate this when in the postoperative period if you can get a little bit clearer urine i don't think that this is going to cause you know irritative irritative symptoms even if you think about it we've been lazing all the time in the fossa and there's still areas that look uh, alive, you know, and bloody and red. So that is, I think, a proof of how shallow the penetration of the of the laser is. So, so that's nice. Now I'm changing the I'm changing the <coughs> laser cystoscope for the nephroscope. This is the maneuvers needed to change because we will need a nephroscope to introduce the. <coughs> The morselation blade. And there we are. Open the water. I I tend to use only a single irrigation channel. Many people use two, trying to maximize the entry of water into the bladder and trying to prevent the collapse of the bladder by extreme suction. But what I do is, and I think this is a you know decision that you have to take carefully. What I do is uh, try to make sure that I only aspirate when the mouth of the morselator is not visible. Okay, so here you can see that the tissue is covering the mouth of the morselator. So there will be a lot of tissue coming out and not so much water. So, you know, when you see that there's no engagement uh, of the morse later with the tissue, I think you, you should try to stop sucking water because the, the, the bladder will empty very fast if you keep the blade rotating and the aspiration aspirating for too long, you know, before the, um, the bladder empties, you no? Know? So there we are. It is true that uh, at the beginning of a morselation of large glands, 
the suction has more trouble trying to move such a big mass of tissue, you know, and if you think about it, the blade can move the, the piece because it's floating in the bladder. The blade has a mechanical effort, so has a mechanical movement. So it's a hard uh, transmission of energy to, to the adenoma. And when it's moving to one side, the adenoma is thrown towards that side, but then the suction has to keep it. And uh, it is more difficult. I don't know what happened. Oh, there it goes. It is, it is more difficult to uh, keep the the adenoma attached to the to the blade when it's a big big piece, but of course uh, very fast it will get smaller and the ability of the suction to keep the engagement uh, will increase. This could be you know pointed out as a disadvantage of the end block approach, but I have to say with these fast morselators it is just a relative problem even in this very large glands we can achieve uh, relatively fast morselation rates and but you can see the joy of morselating with with good visibility you know uh here as you can see i push the the blade a little bit inside the bladder because i don't want to be too close uh to the tissue and I really like to be able to see the two little triangles lateral to the blade in the lower part of the image. You see, when you see black color there, that means that you're far away from the bladder. So there's no, no danger of catching the bladder, mucosa, sucking it into the morselation. So I, I really like uh, to work like this. Some people are afraid to push the tip too much into the bladder because they think that this could be dangerous but I think it's safer actually when when you have some reference of where you are in relation to the to the bladder mucosa sometimes you will get a little bit scared because you see proper mucosa you know, being morselated and that's usually the inside of the adenoma you know the prostatic urethral mucosa or the middle lobe uh, mucosa but uh, of course the, you will get used to it and and we use uh, quite large containers to to gather the water that comes out there's a filter that uh, catches the tissue and uh, it is a five liter uh, container so we have had to stop much less uh, during morselation by using these larger containers. So if you can find them, you know, the five liter ones, I think it is an advantage to, to be able to morselate for longer without having to change. Some morselators do not need this and you don't have to stop. Uh, but, uh, well, reducing the number of stops is a, is a good idea. There we are, you see, slowly we're starting to eat the tissue. And this also takes time and you have to be relaxed, you know, enjoying it and not get anxious, you know, sometimes. If, if you have been very stressed during the operation, and that's why I'd recommend not to be stressed, you know, just have this technical mentality then you can get very tired, uh, very wasted to morselation, and morselation needs all of your attention, you know, so that's why you need to develop this calm attitude towards the nucleation, and um, also try to, you know, fall in love with it, enjoy it. <laughs> of course, we have a hard work, uh, surgeons, you know, we have these lists of patients, and we have also to go through the hardships of life, you know, like anybody else. You might have trouble, problems at home, you know, uh, any any kind of problems, you know, and then you have to come to the operating room and let all these things aside and at least try to enjoy the, the moment. I always think in the philosophy of um, 
of the medical attention. No, this patient, you know, has lived in the world for many years, um, and then your paths cross, and in that moment you're going to try to help him with what you're doing, you know, and then whole expertise of your life, the whole effort that you did to to to, to study medicine, you know, to do your residency. All those, you know, nights with uh, where you didn't sleep because you were on call, you know, all the learning from your masters and your colleagues, you know, everything that put you there at that precise moment uh, is there to help this patient. So, um, I, th I think it's beautiful, and I don't know. I, it's very nice, also, of course, when you have experience to, you know, get rid of the stress, uh, you know, that comes with uh, with operations. So that's why also I recommend very, very much to have a trained team. You know, if you can rely on your team, if you know that they're going to respond, if you know that they can help you fast, they know what they're doing, you know, they're not going to forget to give you water for irrigation and things like this. The more structured, you know, the procedure is in your operating room, the more motivated people are. You know, in my team, I think we're all quite proud that we can, you know, perform this operation with such level of uh, prowess, I, I think it's the word. Uh, I don't know, we are proud and I, I'm proud of my team, you know, the, the I always tell them they have to be present in the operation, not not in the operating room. Huh? They can be present in the operating room and their mind could be somewhere else. I need them to be engaged in the operation, which is sometimes difficult because we, we do sometimes long lists with many patients. But I try to keep them motivated and I am demanding, you know, as a, a responsible person in the operating room. So I point out... <laughs> when they forget something or when there is, you know, something that doesn't work well, I try to maintain the standard as high as possible. Of course, I tell them when I get angry, you know, it's not personal. When I tell you, you know, this is not good enough, it's not personal, don't take it personally. It's, it's we, we have to work as a team, you know, with the highest possible standards to take care of the patient and we cannot afford, you know, mistakes and forgive, uh, to forget things or, you know, because they, as you know, you know, if you forget uh, putting water in the bladder, there might be some trouble, you know, and uh, so, but of course, if you have this team, then you can just concentrate on what you're doing. You don't have to keep control of everything that happens in the operating room because it's a lot of people engaged in the... I always say that uh, four eyes see better than two. And for example, when you change the instrument to start the morselation, you have to remember to open the water. And I have instructed my nurses to make sure that I do. So if I forget, and sometimes I do, you know, maybe I start noticing that the, the vision is not clear and then I realize, no. But most often they tell me, open the water, doctor, you, you forgot, you know, and that's, this uh, double check, you know, and uh, so you try to build in safety measures in, in your practice, okay? Sometimes if morselation doesn't progress very well, I like to use this Japanese or, or Asian approach to morselation, which is to put the morselator upside down. And, uh, you know, the Anoma tries to, flow, tries to float, tries to go up and the morselation sometimes uh, goes well. You know, often, as you know, morselation eats selectively the softer tissue and dissects the harder tissue. So it looks as if in the lower part of the adenoma there was more hard tissue and just by changing like this, yeah, well, you get a, you know, some feeling that you're progressing with your enucleation. 
This is just a little twist, but sometimes it can be very helpful. You know, once the adenoma gets smaller, also I I like to get in the fossa like this. You see, and then again, this is more even more relaxed than morselating in the bladder because it is very hard to catch the the capsule and make a hole in the capsule. So, of course, these things, these things could happen, huh? but. Uh, what I mean is that you are a little bit more relaxed when you morselate in the fossa, and also the the walls of the fossa contain the anoma, so it doesn't it moves freely, but it doesn't if it wants to go away too far, it doesn't, you know, because it's inside the fossa, and then it's much easier to catch it again, and um, morselation efficiency is is very good, even when their last tissue that you morselate is the hardest. I always tell the example of the peach, you know, if you eat a peach, you eat the soft meat and at the end you're left with the bone and the morselators behave similar, similarly. So it chews the, the soft tissue, but when it reaches a very hard nodule, it just cannot chew it properly and then at the end you're left with the hard nodule. You know, this is the peach balls uh, that uh, we are referring to. It is true that the perennia Morselator can chew almost everything, you know, sometimes you can see these nodules, how they are dissected, you know, from the rest, and then you're left with the with the hard nodules. So another teaching from this video is that ultrasound estimation of size is not very accurate. And most of the times when they tell you 300 grams, it's not true, you know, it's not not really 300, you know, and uh, of course you have to be sensible to choose your patients wisely according to your experience, but if you use the smaller glands to train your skill, you know, very, very fast you're going to be able to progress towards larger glands, you know, it's the same surgical principles, it's the same surgical strategy. Uh, you just need to be able to work continuously without stopping, because otherwise, if you stop a lot, if you're unsure of, you know, many things, you'd better not engage this very large glands, you know, until you have more experience. Um, but if you, you know, progress. Uh, nicely and you try to develop these skills, you know, the, the ability to dissect continuously, if you can run very nice lines of dissection, you know, uniform, and then you can, you can progress. Sometimes, paradoxically, doing large glands might be easier than doing smaller glands because the quality of the plane is, is much better. But you see, it's a nodular remaining prostate and here I think the bucket of water got full and we had to change. Uh, this is a brief stop. Here as, as you can see I closed the inflow of water to keep the pressure constant and I don't want to over distend the bladder to do a you know cysto distension. But it's interesting that many patients, of course, we give them anti-inflammatory drugs for the first week. Uh, but many patients who complain later on of uh, bladder hyperactivity symptoms usually tell you that they have felt much better the first two or three weeks after the operation, you know. So I wonder if this distension of the bladder will somehow weaken, you know, the bladder in the first uh, couple of weeks and that's why they feel less these uh, irritative irritative symptoms it, it is a clinical observation but it's quite quite common i have to say i don't know if if you will have experienced such comments from your patients but i tend to explain to them like that you know maybe we did a little bit of distension of your of the bladder, and that's why you don't feel the the irritative symptoms so much. Maybe it's the wound, you know, evolution that 
gets more you know, inflamed, or maybe it's because you stopped the anti-inflammatory treatment. Yeah, there are so many things that we don't know. So here again, I open the water, uh, irrigation, and uh, now I have much better suction. You know, when we change the, the, the water, we also change the collecting basket because sometimes it gets full of tissue and the suction has trouble getting, you know, all the way to the, to the, to the mouth of the Morselator blade. And you can see these are the, the beach balls, the fibromas inside the adenoma. And this is just the final moments. So I hope you enjoyed these videos. I get some feedback from people who ask me for more and I will try to keep uploading these videos. It takes a little bit of time to prepare, but I'm happy if uh, you keep finding them useful and inspiring. And I really, really think that one of the best things you could learn as a urologist to help a lot of patients is to do this, this technique. That's a histology, 153 grams, total surgical time, less than one hour. Bye-bye.